You know, you're risking an awful lot by doing this. Well, you know how it is. Once a rebel, always a rebel. Ahsoka, episode four. You know, some people are saying that this is the best Star Wars we've gotten since George Lucas sold it. Really? Really? Okay. Lookie, you're so bad. So as the episode starts, we automatically see we're back to the poor pacing of dialogue with Ahsoka and Sabine. Then no one should. It won't come to that. You're getting four and five counts between lines of dialogue. Duke actually counted 15 uh, between lines of dialogue, and there was no reason for the pause. So we're, we're back to the poor pacing. Uh, I wonder if they're doing this to uh, lengthen the episodes at this point, or is it just poor directing? We get some dialogue between Sabine and Ahsoka as uh, David Tenetbot is bypassing the compressor, and we get the hair to the Empire line. Better that than allowing Thrawn's return as heir to the Empire. Why they even have to use that line? It just brings in the EU that you guys decanonized. Uh, matter of fact, Thrawn's decanonized, but now you've made him canon in a cartoon. We well, see Morgan and Balin, and they're having a conversation. Some decent dialogue between them two. The pacing is correct. Is that a note of fear in your voice? Experience. Um, Ray Stevens just carries such a screen presence that you're automatically drawn to him. His performance is very well. And I think it resonates to acting chops over poor direction sometimes. Um, I'm definitely going to have to go back and watch more of his work because he has such a commanding screen presence. They go back on the ship and they start loading up to go out to the ground base. And Sabine's got her blasters with slides on them. And they're slid forward and she's looking for, I would say, it was an internal magazine, an energy cell. We've never seen anything like this. It, the blasters didn't look right. The way they slid open and slid back, it looked like a real gun. Although the slide was opposite direction. But even the sounds sounded like a real gun being operated. Uh, I know E-11 blasters are modified stens but you wouldn't know that unless you were into guns. So, so just that scene right there distracted me a little bit, pulled me out, and, and I didn't like it. I, she should have just been putting her guns in her holster and getting her gear and putting stuff on her belt instead of doing that. Now, I will say this. This episode leaves a lot of questions, and I mean a lot of questions. I came out of this episode with more questions in my head than I did when I finished the last episode. Because frankly, the last episode was nothing burger but some space ball antics. So while Sabine is loading her guns, Ahsoka explains that this is such high stakes that they have to separate their feelings from themselves and just get the job done. Okay? So why did you go get a rusty Mandalorian? I mean, she could have tagged along with you and Luke Skywalker. I mean, that would have made a lot more sense. You have the only Jedi left in the galaxy, supposedly. Um, but you want to bring him along, I'm sure he'd be more willing to help stop the Empire from rising up. So while David Tenetbot's under the ship, he gets attacked by HK droids. And I said this during the live stream, Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Very much. Duke Devil made a Excellent observation during this scene. What's, what's up? What's up? Whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. How? How is? I, I never understood it when they did it to see three PO. But how? Who? 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 But he's a droid. His mouth is not moving. No, it's just a speaker. And 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 why does he have eyelids? And we actually get to see Sabine show up. Actual Sabine, dropping droids, twin blasters, You're just missing her backpack and some explosives to throw around. Ahsoka's not bad here either. A little slow. Um, she was a very fast fighter. 
Even at her age, she'd still be faster than what she is. You also notice in this scene, this is the only time she uses twin sabers in this whole episode. The rest of the time, she uses a single saber. Why? That is not Ahsoka's fighting style. And like I said, they throw a ton of foreshadowing in here. And we end up on home one. We see Hera bailing on the Republic to go save Ahsoka. General! Watch it. I'm not just going to sit around and do nothing, Lieutenant. But, but you can't leave without authorization. Finally. Finally, Hera does something Hera would do. However, she takes her 10-year-old son with her. No possible war zone. Don't know how I feel about that. But she only takes five X-Wings. And we have the one guy from the Mandalorian. And some randoms. No one we know. Other than the guy from Mandalorian. And Chopper. Where's Zeb? Where's Callus? Where's Rex? All of those people would be involved in this mission if she called them. I still never understood that scene in Mandalorian where Zeb's wearing a, a X-Wing suit. Like, wouldn't he be on his home planet, his new home planet with Callus? That was his whole thing. That's where he went to retire. That was an end of Rebels. Went to go be with his people that he thought were all dead. Another retcon there. There's a scene where she talks to Jason and explains to him why she's doing what she's doing. Mom, how come I have to do what I'm told and you don't? What? I'm supposed to follow. Well, when you're a general, you can disobey orders too until then. Her explanation sucks. It should be like, when you have friends in trouble, you help your friends out, not some cocky pulling rank stuff. Once again, missed opportunity to embellish on the characters and not make them look like assholes. We do get some more dialogue from Ray Stevens. Like I said, best part of the show so far, all of the episodes. I'm loving him, I'm loving him. Favorite character in the show. Have faith. Faith. I lost that a long time ago. We go to this scene where Ahsoka and Sabine are running through the woods and they're trying to make time, but they're being all jumping from tree to tree, all nimbly bimbly. Am I jumping around all nimbly bimbly from tree to tree? No. It doesn't make sense. You're making a, a shit ton of noise running through the forest. Why would you make your path longer? Straight line is fastest. Then we run into uh, Shen and Modork. Shin is even more impressive on screen than Ahsoka or Sabine or Hera is. Her, she has quite a screen presence too. Uh, maybe because the, the costume's better. Uh, she has a more serious look to her. And Ahsoka's not Ahsoka and Sabine's not Sabine. Maybe that's why she pulls more of a presence. Now, her and Sabine go at it, but pay attention to how quickly how quickly Shin has her lightsaber ready. It looks like a Jedi reaching for their lightsaber and it's ignited instantly. It comes into play later on. Now here's my thing. Why is she running from Sabine? Other than to separate her from Ahsoka, but you also notice when Shin is deflecting shots, it looks more like regular Star Wars because there's a flourish to the blade. It's not just a quick solid movement back and forth like they've been showing. Uh, I did like that. It drew my attention. Now, Mo Dork and uh, Soka face off. And it's, I pose, you pose. I pose, you pose. Kind of reminds me of that thing from that movie. Let's say we settle this on the runway. Han Solo. We cut back to the cartographer map room, whatever you want, Star Forge map, whatever you want to call it. They're downloading these coordinates. And I agree with Duke. It looked like chevrons from Stargate is what they were unlocking. It didn't look Star Wars. -y. It looked very Stargate-y. Then we go back to the pose off. Ahsoka and Modort share some blows. And almost a one for one of Ben killing Maul, Ahsoka takes him down. Do we get revealed that it's Starkiller? No. He's a green fart. Some green gas comes spewing out of his armor, and he deflates and falls to the ground. So I guess he was some sort of Dathomirian magic by the fact it was green smoke, and green's usually linked with them. It almost looked like the cloud that Talzin pulled out of Maul when they found him with the spider legs to get the insanity out of him. 
Very similar to Clone Wars type stuff. I understood what it was when I seen it. I just thought it was really bad. That's who he was. He, he just a green fart in a suit of armor. And I did notice when they were doing the last episode and he was in the fighter, it looked more like a knight's armor, like a suit of armor, than, say, an Inquisitor set of armor. So I thought there was something weird there. Everybody stops and looks. And Ahsoka takes off and Sabine is lightsaber battling with Shen, which we already know how this is going to go. Um, now, there's sparks coming off these sabers, which is dumb. And they've never done this before, Disney. But if you go frame by frame, there's some really weird stuff going on with these sparks. I don't know if it's supposed to be an Easter egg or if it's just how they did it. It just looked really weird. I pulled it up on the live stream and we were just clicking through because we were looking at how absurd the sparks were. And there's some really weird stuff going on in the sparks. And also we have smoke now. So two lightsabers making contact create smoke now. This is something new. Uh, we didn't need that for cinematic effect in the movies. So we don't need it in this show. Uh, they're adding so much stuff when they just need to make a good show is all they need to do. We have Shen and Sabine posing, doing a lot of posing. Uh, like I said, it doesn't look good. Now, Morgan, I guess, senses that Ahsoka's coming and decides to leave Balin there with the map. But why is the hyperspace ring in atmosphere now? I will prepare for our departure. Protect the map until I send for you. I mean, she flew up to it and it was in space. Now it's in the atmosphere. Is it just so we can see it? It doesn't make any sense why it would be in space and an atmosphere. I don't get why they did it. I guess it was just so you could see it. So we get Balin waiting for Ahsoka. And he has some lines about how Anakin's legacy is her legacy. Evidently, she has a legacy of just going around and killing people now. Everyone in the Order knew Anakin Skywalker. Few would live to see what he became. But I still want to know, how does Balin know who the hell Vader is? I'm pretty sure this is before Leia was ousted and it was said that her father was Darth Vader. Uh, and in the Disney books now, in the Disney books, it yeah. wasn't a bad book either. But at this point, Mon Mothra is still Chancellor. Mon Mothra retires because she's sick and Leia becomes Chancellor. So no one knows who Vader is. There's only like three or four people who knew who Vader was and they're all dead except for Luke and Leia. Um, so I want to know how everyone knows. Now pay attention to how Balin and Ahsoka draw their sabers. It's clunky. It's very weird looking for Star Wars. Normally a Jedi reaches for it. And it pretty much flies to their hand. Um, it's not this weird stuff that they're doing here. Now, I also have a question. Why is Ahsoka only using one saber? She only used one saber with Modor. So why is she using one saber now? Doesn't make any sense. Uh, when she fought Asaz Ventures, when she fought Grievous, when she fought Maul, she used two sabers. Why would she use one against Balin? It makes no sense. She does a stupid spin move on a rock, which does not look like Ahsoka. Ahsoka would have flipped over top of him to try to get the advantage. Balin is fighting like Vader. He is very swinging for the fences with every swing, big, powerful swings. Now, Vader had to do that because he had a loss of mobility. Very well explained. He didn't move like Anakin Skywalker anymore, so he had to change the way he fought. Balin fights very much like Vader did. I guess they're trying to reference Vader because the, you got the Hall scene in the first episode. Um, he doesn't come across as Vader, and, and actually his character is pretty interesting with some of his dialogue. Um, I, I'm interested to see where his character goes. The only thing I like in this show is Balin. And I know, oh, you just like him because he's a white male. No, because he actually has a little bit of depth. Now we go back to Shen and Sabine, and we get uh, Shen overwhelming her, knocking her to the ground. And Sab Sabine does a fake force push, and Shen reacts to it. Give her credit. And then she hits her, with the, hits her in the lightsaber with the gauntlet. You have no power. 
typical Mandalorian move. I'd expect that from a Mandalorian. I guess Shin didn't. Shin throws down a smoke bomb and escapes, runs back to the map room, I guess. And uh, you see Sabine get up and run and leaves her helmet laying on the ground. Now, this is where I have a major problem. That is ancestral armor that has been in her family for thousands of years. It's explained in Rebels when she talks about her armor and how special it is. Would she really leave her helmet laying on the dirt floor of a forest? Especially like 10 feet from her. That makes no sense for her to leave the helmet. So during the fight with Balin and Ahsoka, she makes this horrendous face. I mean, horrendous face. Like, they should have been like, you need to change that. No, it makes a good thumbnail, though. There's these kicks. And like Duke said, is this an homage to Return of the Jedi where Luke went to kick the guy and didn't make contact? I think we're beyond that. Uh, we need to uh, make stuff look real. Um, now, Ray Stevens sells the hell out of these kicks, but none of them even make contact. Clear to see. Uh, we went frame by frame on uh, Wednesday, and you could see that no kick ever touched him. All they had to do was rotate behind Ray Stevens' back a little bit. It would have been fine. So Ahsoka's going for the golden snitch again. Why she never uses the force to grab the ball is beyond me. It would make sense, and you could have Balin, you know, stop her. That would work. That's why they're still fighting over the ball, but she's just trying to reach out and grab it. When she finally reaches out and grab it, and it pretty much sets fire to her hand, you can hear it sizzling. She's holding on to it for an extended amount of time. She didn't pick it up, just throw it. She's holding on to it for a hot minute. As soon as I seen this, I'm like, Indiana Jones. Uh, is that how they're going to use the map to get to Thrawn? Because you already know that it's not happening. They're not going to make it. If they just, they got the map destroyed, it show would be over. So that's why I'm, they're going to Indiana Jones this shit. They're going to use her hand for the map. It's dumb. It's pretty dumb. So Shin shows up and Ahsoka sees her while she's forced on this edge and automatically thinks that Sabine is dead. And she picks her up with what looks like force crush. Sweet. Now that's a dark side power. The only Jedi I know of to use it other than Luke used it in Mandalorian season two was Mace Windu, but Mace Windu even used a dark side of the lightsaber form. So, and it was only used against droids, was not supposed to be used against humans. So she grabs her with that, throws her up against Stonehenge. She's out. Balin's trying to tell Ahsoka, we don't have to, it doesn't have to come to this. You need to come to this. But you know no other way. And then Sabine shows up and grabs the map and holds the blaster to it. And Balin, like, knocks her off the cliff. No danger there. I mean, Jedi's do fall all the time and don't die. Balin's talking to Sabine, and he talks about... I know you feel that Ezra Bridger is the only family you have left. Her family dying. So I take it they died in a night of a thousand tears. Uh, we still don't have a time for that. Your family died on Mandalore. Because your master didn't trust you. Uh, from the leaks that are coming out, it looks like we're going to get a night, night of a thousand tears next episode. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. But that's another reason why she wouldn't have left her helmet. That's the last thing she has left of her family. So Ezra is a missing member of her family, which is why she wants to get him back. And she succumbs to Balin's influence and gives him the map. So after Sabine gives him the map, they go to finish downloading the codes. Once it's done, Balin uses a lightsaber and destroys the snitch. Wait, lightsabers destroy metal? But they can go through your body and be held there for three to five seconds and not cook your guts? Ugh. Come on, guys. Get straight with the cannon. But hey, look. David Tenenbaum hooks two wires together and the comms work. And there's Hera. Weren't all the comms jammed as soon as they entered the system? Did they just turn the jam off? Why would they do that? They'd have to expect, you know, if 
Ahsoka was there, there was more ships coming. And we see Hera coming to the rescue and picking the ship up and coming that way. And as they get lined up to run an attack on this hyperspace ring, we get the Holdo maneuver. Since it's a ring, she hyperspaces right over top of them and kills everybody that's not a character with pot armor. Could have had one of the nobodies survive. I mean, they weren't wearing red uniforms. And then we get Jason saying the classic line. More member berries. Mom? I, I've got a bad feeling. So Ahsoka wakes up. It almost looks like it's waves for a second. But as she stands up, you realize, guess what, guys? It's the world between worlds. Told you. And then we hear, I didn't expect to see you so soon. And of course, we get Anakin Skywalker. Now, I will say this. The Skywalker saga is over, right? Isn't that what Rise of Palpatine was supposed to do in the Skywalker saga? They were going to close it out, start all new chapters. And here we are with a Skywalker in our show once again. Now, Anakin looks like shit. This looks like a full CGI render. It doesn't look de-aged. Um, I think we picked this image apart for 20 minutes on the reaction stream. Link is going to be in the description for that. Uh, it's really bad. It's really bad. Even me using it in a thumbnail, I had to pass it through several filters so you could even get it so you could see the details in it. So, is Star Wars, it's dark. Everything's dark. You can't see anything. So that's where the episode ends. Now, there are rumors that this is the sun from Mortis. And if you're like, Wookiee, what's Mortis? Got to go watch Clone Wars to understand it. Uh, and they're saying it's the sun from Mortis and not Anakin. At this point, it could be anything. I still say we haven't seen the owl. The owl that always followed Ahsoka from Mortis. Um... I am interested to see how far this goes down the rabbit hole. Uh, this isn't Rebels. This isn't Ahsoka. None of the characters in this show resemble themselves other than Chopper and David Tenetbot. That's it. Uh, I don't understand how Dave Filoni is getting all of this wrong. Uh, there's no emotional connection uh, with Ahsoka. Maybe a little bit with Sabine over the Ezra stuff. But it took, it, in my opinion, it took too long to get there. Did you think this episode saved Star Wars? I think this show is failing. Now, episode five is going to be in movie theaters. Uh, but the tickets are free, so there's no box office record. Because I was really interested to see that, but they're free. So you can go watch it in movie theaters. I'll be watching it Wednesday live with Fractured Filter. We might have another guest. Uh, Duke Devil will be out of the country, so he'll be watching in spirit. My entire issue about this series is that Dave Filoni has hit every single thing that Star Wars fans complained about in the sequel trilogy. People don't die when they get stabbed. The Holdo maneuver. Uh, poor plot lines. Heavy plot armor. Um, he has 100% gone through and checked the boxes of everything that made the fans mad with the sequel trilogy. Is this intentional? Did he think they were good things? Does he just have bad taste? Let me know what you think below. Drop a like, sub if you want. I'm getting close to 500, trying to push that number. Y'all have a good one. Lucky, you're so bad.